Okay, I'm gonna. Oh, okay. Okay, folks, you want to grab something to drink? We'll get started in a couple minutes. All right, okay, okay. Yeah, if that does weird things, let me know. If she does weird things, let me know. Check one, two, 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 two. We're all good? To the millions watching at home? That's awesome. All right, folks. Everybody all settled? You make per poor Bert sit by himself? Oh. I'm not poor, I'm rich. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. This is the last week of uh, our Lifehouse Lab uh, dealing with eschatology, and we spent the last four weeks in Revelation, and so we're going to spend tonight in Revelation chapter 19 to 22. I'm going to go over just in a minute um, kind of our, our, what we're going to look to cover tonight, but thanks for being here and, and for being here for, most of you have been here for the whole six weeks, and uh, I want to hopefully carve out some time tonight to discuss and talk and clarify and any comments and questions you may have. Um, it was funny, I was just, uh, uh, somebody said to me today, oh, this is the last week, and, and, uh, and uh, what are you going to do if the power goes out? And, and I just basically said, the only thing that's stopping tonight is if Christ returns himself this evening, which would then prove me right. So that would be really, really cool. And... Uh, <laughs> Or the rapture, or the rapture happens, or imagine everything we predicted is wrong. You know, so that's great. So good times. Um, before we get started, uh, I just want to pray for our night. So would you bow your heads with me as we pray, Heavenly Father? Um, again, we come before you uh, in need of you and in need of understanding. We're again heading into um, your word. Um, trusting that it will not return void, and it's a meaning that, Lord, that we're going to learn something tonight, and we get to learn more of you. Uh, I pray that as we um, kind of navigate difficult waters, that you, by your Spirit, would give us understanding, uh, that you would unite us tonight, that we would, um, yeah, see you bigger. Uh, Lord, understand that you're more sovereign than we know. And so we pray all of these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So here's what I'm thinking of for this evening, is I won't, I'm in a, just in a few minutes, I want to read uh, through chapters four and five. We haven't read them at all yet or touched base on them, yet. but they're pretty self-explanatory. And so as we read through them, I mean, it's, it really isn't in need of much interpretation of what does this mean or what does that mean? Uh, we did look at chapter five a little bit um, when we were talking about the scrolls that began to be opened in chapter six. Um, we're going to kind of do a, a brief review and summarize kind of where we've kind of journeyed through uh, for the first for the last four weeks, the last four weeks. But we're going to spend a bulk of our time in Revelation 19 and 20 in the millennial reign of Christ. And uh, and so you know what I'm like, well, we're just going to get there soon, and then we're going to read through uh, the Great White Throne of Judgment in chapter 20, 
uh, read through the new creation in New Jerusalem in chapter 21. And then it's not five takeaways. I don't know why I put five. Four takeaways from this study. Maybe you're the fifth. Hmm. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> actually, actually, no, there are five takeaways because somebody had sent me theirs that I, they wanted me to read. And so... Um, and so if you've been here for six weeks, thank you very much. For those who are watching online, thank you so much. I know a few of you ha have, and uh, I really appreciate that and uh, making this journey with us. It's the most attended lab we've ever had, and, um, and that's encouraging that you've um, But the one thing I, 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 I wanted to say right from the beginning, uh, many years ago, it was uh, September of 2010, uh, Julie and I were celebrating our, our 10 year anniversary and um, I had this really wonderful plan for the whole weekend. And so I arranged it with my parents and I said, hey, look, we're gonna drop the kids off. Julie doesn't know I'm doing any of this. Uh, I'm gonna kidnap her for the weekend and, uh, and we're gonna go to Stratford to the Shakespeare Festival. Anybody been to Stratford to Shakespeare Festival? Love it, it's one of, uh, Julie and I love going to that. And, um, and so it was our 10 year anniversary, so it was a big deal and to even pump myself up more as a husband. Uh, her favorite actor is Christopher Plummer. Anybody know where Christopher Plummer is? Okay. And uh, so he was starring in The Tempest that weekend, and we had these great seats. And so, yeah, I was like husband of the year. Uh, and so did that. So I dropped off the kids at my parents' place, took Julie away for the weekend. And the plan was, was to uh, connect with my parents, to meet up with them at Rock Point. You know where Rock Point is out in Dunville, Provincial Park? And so, uh, and so the weekend was fantastic. And so the only, the only thing is, the only way I knew how to get to Rock Point was from my house. So if you can imagine, if this is kind of a map, uh, our house is here, we'll say Fort Erie, can of Ridgeway here. So Stratford would be kind of up here and then Rock Point would be here. So I only knew how to get to Rock Point from my house, but I didn't want to travel all the way from Stratford back to my house in this way. Can you track with me so far? So this is 2010, so I borrowed my dad's GPS. <laughs> this is before it was on your phones, before Google Maps was a real thing. Because I, I figured, okay, as long as I got the GPS, I'm fine. I'll just take Stratford and I'll just get some road or whatever that'll connect. Easy, no problem. And so we leave Stratford Sunday morning and we're heading towards Rock Point, following the GPS on roads I've never been on before, trusting in the GPS. You already know where this is going. Trusting in the GPS. And so we go down this long winding road. Again, I don't know where I'm going, so I don't know if it's right. I don't know if it's wrong. And so we get to uh, uh, this uh, road... We don't see any signs, <laughs> but on the GPS, it says you're about five minutes away. So I'm starting to go, this doesn't look too good. <laughs> so sure enough, we're going down and we're in the midst of cornfields. And I'm watching on the GPS and I've got cornfields on the left and on the right. And we finally get to the end of this road and it says, you have arrived at your destination. And I have a cornfield on the left, a cornfield on the right, and I'm looking at a cornfield. I tell you all of this because I really hope that's not where you are tonight, where you've gone through five weeks and you feel like you're looking at a cornfield and you got a cornfield and then you're like, oh, what do I do now? And so, and needless to say, we did backtrack. I did go back home and then we did come, so we we're hours late. Right, if, if I had the GPS on my phone like I do today, it would have been perfectly fine. But my hope is, and hopefully we'll talk about this a little bit later on when we talk about clarifying anything you need clarified. If you have any comments, any questions, um, hopefully this journey hasn't left you looking at cornfields lost and going, well, how did I get to this place? And so hopefully in through our takeaways, we can kind of gather and you can um, take something away from this. But I'm trusting that you have already. And I'm hoping that you have already. So if you have your Bibles, Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, and I'm going to read this, okay? You can follow along. Revelation 4. After this I looked, and there in heaven was an open door. The first voice that I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must, first, what must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and there was a throne in heaven, and someone was seated on it. The one seated there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald surrounding the throne. Around the throne were 23 thrones, and on the throne sat 24 elders dressed in white clothes with golden crowns on their heads. Flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder came from the throne. 
Seven fiery torches were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Something like a sea of glass similar to crystal was also before the throne. Four living creatures covered with eyes in the front and back were all around the throne on each side. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like an ox. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and they were covered with eyes around and inside day and night. They never stopped saying, holy, 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 Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. Whenever the living creatures gave glory, honor, and thanks to the one seated on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fell down before the one seated on the throne and worshiped the one who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne and say, our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor, and power, because you have created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. I'm just going to keep going. We're just going to keep going through chapter 5. Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides, sealed with seven seals. I also saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even look into it. I wept and wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or even to look in it. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw one like a, like a slaughtered lamb standing in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. He went and took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and golden bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slaughtered and you were purchased and you purchased people for, for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign on earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and also the living creatures and the elders. Their number was countless thousands plus thousands of thousands. And they said with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. I heard every creature in heaven on earth and under the earth and on the sea and everything in them say blessing and honor and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Chapter four and chapter five gives us this wonderful, robust, really graphic, majestic picture of heaven and seeing God on the throne and the Lamb, Jesus Christ, who was the one that was able to open, worthy to open the seven seals and the scroll. And what we have in chapter four, through all of its wording, so if you look at um, Jasper, Carnelian, Rainbow, Emerald, we have flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder that came from the seven fiery torches burning before the throne. We have a sea of glass similar to, to crystal. We have everything in chapter four pointing to really one major thing, and that's just simply this, the sovereignty and majesty and glory of God. So nothing really needs to be interpreted other than if you're wondering, well, who are the 24 elders or who are the four living creatures? So most commentators believe that the four the 24 elders represent the church, and uh, if we see in and throughout the book of Revelation, these 24 elders are usually worshiping, and so most commentators believe that these 24 elders represent the church at worship. The four living creatures, and it's likely that the four figures are designed to represent all of the created order. So... Psalm 19 says this, so if you want to kind of connect these two things, and so if these four living creatures represent everything that was created, all of creation, animals, um, all the things that God has created, Psalm 19 gives us kind of a picture of, of that that says, the heavens declare the glory of God. You know this verse? The heavens declare the glory of God, and the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day they pour out speech. 
And night after night, they communicate knowledge. So Psalm 19 gives us this picture of, of God's creation pouring back in worship. And we have in chapter 4 as well this picture of all that is created, worshiping God, worshiping the one and only God. And in verse 11, it says, because he has created all things. So we have those who are created, all that is created, worshiping the creator at all times in heaven. Chapter 5 um, as I said, describes Jesus Christ, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, who has conquered by way of the cross and his resurrection, so he is able to open the scroll, and he is the one that is worshipped. He is the one who is able to open the scrolls that we would read in chapter 6 and onward. What's interesting, and I want to make sure, and all the things that we've talked about, and, and I know I'll mention this, and it's kind of funny how this has kind of become a joke by saying perhaps, and and we all say perhaps. Uh, there is no perhaps in chapter 4 and 5. That is what it's about. This is about the sovereignty and majesty and glory of God and about who Jesus is and that he has conquered and that he is worthy and that he is able. So there is no perhaps there. Do we understood? Everything else, you can go perhaps. But chapter 4 and chapter 5 is clearly about, it's about one thing. It's about worshiping the Lord and Jesus. Chapter 6 then, as we had said, chapter 6 then kind of takes us off into the opening of the seals. And we talked about the seals and the trumpets and the bowls. And do you remember what the word was, uh, the theory that we were, that I was, that I've been teaching over these last five weeks? Anybody? Progressive recapitulate. You already won a book, so I can't give you another one. Uh, that's correct. Yeah. So, and so what we've been talking about and what we've been teaching is that the seals, trumpets, and bowls are describing the same events from different angles. We looked at that illustration of a football game and looking at the camera angles, and if those three cameras came together, they would almost sound like they're describing different games or a different play, but in reality, they're describing the same thing from different angles. And so the seals and the trumpets in the bowls that we would find in chapter 6, in chapter 8, in chapter 16 are describing the same event. And we talked about how in the sixth seal, the sixth trumpet, and with the sixth be bowl being poured out, we've kind of come to this climax, and, in, and it looks like it's the end. And so the seals, trumpets, and bowls is God allowing and ordaining judgment to come upon the whole earth over the course of human history between the first and second advents of Christ. Now, this is all just a review, and you're like, oh, I know all this stuff already, okay? I just want to make sure we're all on the same page because we're going to be working towards chapter 19 but that the bulk of Revelation is really God pulling back the curtain so that John can see everything that is currently happening. Okay? That God is allowing and ordaining judgments to come upon the earth between the two advents of Christ. That's his, um, his coming to the earth, his, his, his death and his resurrection, and his ascension into heaven, which he talks about in Revelation chapter 12. And then from that point until he returns, we have Revelation Chapter 12 and chapter 13, if you remember, was the very real and cosmic conflict between good and evil that is present in every generation. We talked about last week, chapter 17 and chapter 18, and about Babylon the Great and its defeat. And so chapter 17 and chapter 18 is about Babylon, and chapter 18 describes, well, its defeat, but its its influence on the world. And so let me just give you another summary. If, if you don't remember what we talked about, again, this was two weeks ago. The Babylon the Great is described as the ungodly social and economic system that in the first century, as John is receiving this, would be the Roman Empire. So therefore, Rome and all wicked world systems take on that symbolic name, Babylon the Great. Babylon the Great is applied to the ungodly kingdom in the New Covenant era. It is described, in my own words, the wave of culture. The pursuit of worldly pleasures and social status. It is the personification, again, this is my wording, it is the personification of the desire to be rich and famous, which has existed forever, Right? And then we finished off talking about uh, that a battle is coming. So the end of chapter 16, 16 
chapter 16 uh, describes, and we're going to talk more about this today, the Battle of Armageddon. So we've talked about the beasts, we talked about, uh, sorry, the beast, the false prophet, talked about Babylon the Great. We've covered just about everything, and I know it's about making your head explode. But before we jump into chapter 19, I want you to write down this, chapter 7, chapter 11, chapter 14, and chapter 19. We have intermittently throughout the book of Revelation, these wonderful snapshots of the celebration of the saints. So in 7 verse 10, it says, And they cried out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. Chapter 19 verse 6 says, And then I heard something like the voice of a vast multitude, like the sound of cascading waters, and like the rumbling of loud thunder, saying, Hallelujah, because our Lord, the Almighty, reigns. So in and amongst everything that is so complex and maybe hard to understand, and we've got seals and trumpets and bowls, and then we've got two witnesses, and then we've got right a, a bitter scroll, if you remember from way back, you know, week three, week four, whenever we talked about uh, in Revelation chapter 10. But intermittently through, we have God being praised by his church. And he loves it. And he loves it. So, that brings us to chapter 19. So, let's go there. If you haven't gone there already. So, chapter 19, verse 11. <coughs> verse 11 to 16 says this. Okay, so... This is after we've talked about Babylon the Great. They've just worshipped and they've just celebrated the defeat and the fall of Babylon. And then John says, Then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and with justice he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses, wearing pure white linen. A sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will rule them with an iron rod, and he will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God the Almighty. And he has a name written on his... Did we not already talk about a white horse at some point in time? Yes, we did. So way back in chapter 6, verse 2, it talks about the white horse as the seals were opened. I'm telling you this because there are theories that would say that that white horse in, in chapter 6, verse 2, is this same white horse. It is not. It is not. This, we're talking right here, this rider on this white horse in chapter 19 is Jesus Christ. He is faithful and true, capital F, capital T. And it says that he judges. He judges. Let me read to you from John chapter 5. And Jesus is speaking towards this. Jesus is saying to the Jewish leaders, Truly I tell you, the Son is not able to do anything on his own, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son like, likewise does these things. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything that he is doing, and he will show him greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. And just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so the Son also gives life to whom he wants. Now look at this. The Father, in fact, judges no one, but has given all judgments to the Son. What we see in Revelation 19. So that all people may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, I tell you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so also has he granted to the Son to have life in himself. Listen to verse 27. And he has granted him the right to pass judgment because he is the Son of Man riding on a white horse. Do not be amazed at this because a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good things to the resurrection of life but those who have done wicked things to the resurrection of condemnation. We have this picture of the rider on white horse and his judgment that he's bringing. 
John chapter 5, personified in Revelation chapter 19. It says that his eyes were like a fiery flame. We read that in, John, in, John, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 14, that says his, the hair on his head was white as wool, and white as snow in his eyes like a fiery flame. His robe dipped in blood. We'd see that reflected in Revelation 5, verse 6, that's, that we just read that said, then I saw the one like a lamb, it's like a, sorry, like a slaughtered lamb standing in the midst of the throne. And then we, he has a name, and his name is called the Word of God. Anybody want to take a guess where in the Bible that would be found? John 1. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was, sorry, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. A sharp sword came from his mouth. We would find that in chapter 1, verse 16 so that he might strike down the nations with it, and he would rule them with an iron rod. We find that in Revelation chapter 12, <laughs> verse 5. He will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God the Almighty. We would find that in Revelation 14, verses 14 to 20. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. This <laughs> is Jesus. What we read here in Revelation 19 is both a description, identification, and identification of the one who brings judgment and what he has come to do. Not too often in the book of Revelation will we find things written chronologically. We talked about that from the very beginning, and we'll touch base on that a little bit as well tonight. But what we've just read directly connects to the next part. We have the one that's bringing judgment. We have Jesus Christ who's coming with the sword out of his mouth. Remember, he doesn't have a weapon in his hand. It's his word. That is his weapon. And that leads us right into chapter 17. From verse 17 to verse 21, we have this picture of a battle. So hopefully, maybe on, on if your Bibles are open, you, you can kind of see the end of Revelation 19 and kind of the beginning of Revelation 20. You might have to flip a little bit here because that's where we're going to spend a bulk of our time right now. In Revelation 19, 17 to 21, and in chapter 20, verses 1 to 10. So I talked about this last week. So as, as, as time moves forward and as, as, as time passes, I said it seems like, it seems like we're, we're, we're going to get, things on earth are going to get worse progressively. And that at some point in time, we talked about this last week in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that it talks about a man of lawlessness. And it talks about, in Revelation chapter 17, about a beast who, who was and, uh, and who is not and who is to come, so that there is this sense that there is a antichrist, which all of you have heard that term before, I'm sure, and uh, that is to come. It seems like that's what the Bible's talking about. And it talks about that this, there's this climax, this, this, this pinnacle of where this is going to end up in this last time battle. So the seals, the trumpets, the bowls are happening over human history between the two advents of Christ, and it will slowly build and, and progressively get worse. And, and to be honest, I'm not even really sure what that means, of get worse. And I said this, I think back in week one, it would be incredibly arrogant of me to say, oh, it's going to get worse. And then there's somebody from Nigeria that's been, you know, had a family member decapitated because they're Christians who have more than enough right to come and smack me in the face and go, what do you mean get worse? Right? How can it get worse than what we've been going through? So keep that in mind. So when I say, oh, it's going to get worse, it just, it just seems like, it just seems like that's what Revelation is talking about when, as we move through chapter 18, sorry, chapter 17, and then into the end of chapter 19, we have a gathering of armies coming against Jesus and the church. So I talked last week about chapter 16. So the sixth bowl is poured out in chapters, sorry, verses 12 to 14. Let me just read it so we can refresh our memory. The sixth, the sixth uh, poured out his bowl. Then I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming from the dragon's mouth, the beast's mouth, and the mouth of the false prophet. So they're spewing lies. That's Satan. That is Satan's work in through 
perverted government and through the false prophets, so perverted religion, perverted religious institutions. And it says, for demonic spirits performing signs and that travel to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. And that's the battle of Armageddon. So that's chapter 16. And then Revelation 19, verses 17. And chapter 20, verses 7 to 10, seem to be all talking about the same event. I've tried to put this on one slide. I don't know if, if, if you can read that. Well, I can read it, so that's... that's. <laughs> chapter 16, verses 12 to 14, chapter 19, verse 17 to 21, and chapter 20, verse 7 to 10, seem to be talking about the same event seems to be talking about the same event, which is the final battle, Satan's forces against the rider on the white horse and his army. But what's interesting, let me just read this. this let me just read uh, verse 19. I'll read, you know what, I'll read verse 19, 17, 21, and I'll read that, that portion from chapter 20 as well. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he called out in a loud voice, saying to all the birds flying high overhead, come, gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of the kings, the flesh of military commanders, the flesh of the mighty, the flesh of horses and of their riders, and the flesh of everyone, both free and slave, small and great. Then I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and against his army. But the beast was taken prisoner, and along with it, the false prophet, who had performed signs, who performed the, so yeah, performed the signs in its presence. He deceived those who accepted the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its, its image with these signs. Both of them were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword that came from the mouth of the rider on the white horse. Scan down to 20 verse 7. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. They came across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the encampment of the saints, the beloved city. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed them. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. It's interesting that we keep calling this a battle, but if we just read it, and, and really look at it, if I'm thinking of a battle, and if I was to say that, that this side of the room was going to battle this side of the room, and, and we were going to describe that, I'd say, oh, this, this side's charging, and, and, and you know, Matthias like, he's like, that sounds like a pretty good idea. They're charging, and, and, and it looks like this side's winning, but oh, no, 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 this side's, this side's right? Mateo, he's, 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 he's got muscles, I'm sure, somewhere. And, and so he's, he's fighting back, and, and so you know what I mean? Like, you've got this back and forth battle. There's nothing of that in, in there. Like there's, there, there's no, it, you know, Jesus is winning and then, oh, it looks like he was going to, you know, like nothing. Really almost instant, instantaneously, like Jesus comes, you can call it a battle if you want, and then he wipes them out. Like that's it. It's over. So we say battle, but <laughs> it's not really, it's not really a battle. But between Revelation 19, 17 to 21, and the battle described there, and chapter 20, verses 1 to 10, those two portions that I just read, is what is known as the millennium. Six weeks, and here we are, finally. So I want to read those it particularly because they all connect. So in, verse, in chapter 20, verses 1 to 6, we would find what is called the millennium or the millennial reign of Christ. Way back in week, in week number one, we looked at all of the theories that exist. And so there are premillennialists, two different kinds uh, that we're going to look at. I'm just going to go over that for you. We have postmillennialists, we have amillennialists, and then we have different variations of all of those three. But everything revolves around this one passage, Revelation 20. Verses one to six. So every, you know, if like, this is where the stances come from, are these six verses. Like, so, so think how much time we've spent in the book of Revelation. And here we are finally on the last day. 
and like, but this is where everything, you know, like, like self-identified as premillennialists or postmillennialists. It's around these six verses. And so the premillennialist uh, believes that this is where we are right now, between this cross and this considered the second coming. We talked about um, the rapture in week number two. And so according to a, a pre-tribulational, pre-millennialist view, is that at some point in time, uh, Christ will return, the church will be raptured, there'll be a resurrection of, of those who believe in Jesus and who have passed away, they will come out from their graves, and they will meet Christ in the air, and then uh, disappear. So some, of the, some people call this a secret rapture. Um, if you've watched Left Behind movies, okay, that's what you would, you would see this. And, and so if, according to this theory, we would all just disappear and our clothes would be on our chairs, right? Which makes you wonder what, what we look like in, on the way up. Anyways, don't, don't go there. Okay, so that happens. And then we have this uh, tribulation, this, this period of time through this, where, uh, according to this theory, you would find the, the seals followed by the trumpets, followed by the bulls. And then you have the second coming. Christ returns with the church. And right here, I know it doesn't say so, but right here, according to this theory, actually I'm going to show another slide in a minute, is where you would find the Battle of Armageddon at the end of the tribulation. So somewhere through the tribulation, according to the premillennialist view, the Antichrist rises up, is a peacemaker, and then turns on the world. If you're a dispensationalist, which we'll look at in a second, you would turn on that, that um, Antichrist is going to turn on Israel. But the battle that we just talked about from Revelation 19, verses 17 to 21, happens here. Okay, Then we have... Again, they're, they're following chronologically a thousand-year literal reign on earth. So Christ is on earth with the church that is returned with him, reigns for a thousand years on earth. Then we have, it's not listed here, but the battle that I, that I read where Satan is defeated, Gog and Magog are mentioned, that happens here. And then there's the last judgment and then an eternity, new heavens and new earth. Now, the next slide is going to give us a little bit more detail, um, and this is a theory, um, they're all theories, let's be reminded, of, I've, mine's a theory as well, uh, that is actually gaining popularity, like a lot of popularity. I mean, it, it, it had been earlier on in the 1900s where it really gained popularity. It was taught in Dallas Theological Seminary. And, um, but gaining more traction, I think because of the, the war in Israel, and I think that's drawn some attention. So this gives us just a little bit more detail. So here we are here, the church age, that's where we are right here tonight, Lifehouse. Meeting tonight is right here. We've got the rapture that we mentioned. We have a seven-year tribulation. Again, this kind of expands it a little bit more. It talks about the reign of the Antichrist. Um, according to a dispensationalist view, it's the restoration of Jews to Palestine, the conversion of, remnant, of the remnant of Israel. They believe that the temple will be rebuilt, the priesthood and sacrifices and the cult ritual restored. But... There is a theory. How many of you have ever heard of the Ezekiel War, that term? Nods. Okay, some of you, not a lot of you. So there's a, uh, an epic battle that is described in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And, uh, and so according to a premillennial, pre-tribulational, dispensational theory, that battle, the Ezekiel 38 and 39 battle, happens before the rapture. So that is kind of the sign when you... When you see, and this is the theory, when you, when you see or hear about Israel going to battle with Russia, then the rapture is just around the corner. And the reason why I say that is I'm going to mention Ezekiel 38 and 39 in a minute. So the, the Ezekiel war happens here, rapture happens, seven years of tribulation. The battle of Armageddon is right here. The beast and the false prophet are defeated, thrown into the lake of fire. Christ reigns on earth with the saints here. Satan is bound here. And then you have another battle here. Satan is loosed. You have the judgment of the wicked. So you've got war, tribulation, war, millennial reign of Christ, war, tribulation. Okay? Everybody, make, everybody got it? Makes complete sense. Anybody heard that before? I think, I think I stretched it out, but I think you're pretty familiar, okay? We talked about, this was the post-millennialist view. 
uh, where the thousand years or the millennium that's described in, in Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 to 6 is not a literal thousand years. But with the, what makes the post-millennialist um, theory popular is you can see there it says that the world will get better. Okay, the gospel will increase, it will advance, and we'll see a gradual Christianization of the world. And then Christ's return here, and so all of the battles would take place right here. From 16, 19, and chapter 20 would take place right here, and then there would be a final judgment, new heavens and new earth. The, I have a problem with this theory, um, and it's specifically because of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Anybody remember... Or anybody have any, any idea of why this theory might not work biblically? I gave you the answer, which is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The man of lawlessness that is to come. What has to happen before the man of lawlessness appears? What does it say in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? The apostasy, right? This great apostasy, this great giving up of the faith and abandoning the faith. So that's where I'm like, oh, I don't know how you can work 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and and this great apostasy that's to come in a theory that says, no, things are just going to get better and better and better and, and more Christianized. Yep. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. It's ridiculous. But they would all say, they would all say, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 is... The verse, it's the, it's the hurdle in their theory. It's, it's the, yeah, I'm not too sure what to do with that, right? Um, and then lastly, the amillennialist view. Now, amillennial means no millennium, and, and so amillennialists don't believe that. Um, they believe that we're in the millennium right now, and that uh, the consummation is not yet. So we are in between the cross and the consummation, and that right here, it doesn't say so, but right here would be, as I said, a kind of a, a gradually, it doesn't show it here, progressively things on earth getting a little bit worse and worse and worse. Then the final battle between Jesus and the beast and the antichrist, um, beast, antichrist, false prophet, dragon, all thrown into the lake of fire. So it's pretty simple, a lot more simple, not many arrows on these graphs. Um, and so this may resemble what we've been talking about for the last six weeks. This is, this is where I would lean towards, is this theory, an all-millennialist theory. Although, I, again, all-millennial meaning no millennium. I, don't, I, I believe we are in the millennial reign of Christ, and I'm about to tell you why. So I believe that, I believe that in, in 20 verses 1 to 6, that it's not referencing a literal 1,000 years of Christ reigning on the earth but rather a recapitulation of what we have already been introduced to many times throughout the book of Revelation. And I want to give you four reasons why. And all three of those passages, all the wars or the, the descriptions of a war that we have looked at, uh, the two that are surrounding the millennial reign of Christ, all are connected. So the first reason is that the language that is used about the battle is similar, incredibly similar. Actually, very, 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 very similar. Those are technical terms, very, very, very. So Ezekiel 38 and 39 is a prophecy about the war uh, as well. So they're all pointing towards one battle, good versus evil, Satan versus Jesus. And so Ezekiel 38 and 39 is a prophecy, a vision given to Ezekiel where he's describing the same war as well. And we would see the wording in Ezekiel 38, 39, in Revelation 16, in Revelation 19, 17 to 21, and 20 verses 7 to 11. Very, very similar. So for example, these are all examples of kind of an overlapping uh, of that language. So Ezekiel 38 and 39 talks about Gog and Magog as well. So you'd find that in 38 chapter, verse 2, 20 verse 8. In Ezekiel 39, 4, and in verses 17 to 20, and in Revelation 19, verses 17 to 18, you'd find references to birds that are flying overhead and feasting on flesh. In Ezekiel 38, 
In Revelation 19 and Revelation 20, fire and sulfur is mentioned. In Revelation 16, 19, 20, it talks about Satan deceiving the nations. And this part right here, gathering for war and, and Jesus winning. I mean, it, like all of these parallels. So in gathering for war, we've got Ezekiel 38, verses 4 and 15. We've got chapter 16, chapter 19, chapter 20, right? All talks about this gathering for war at the end. And then finally, the victory that is won, we would read in, in Ezekiel chapter 38, all of Ezekiel 39, Revelation 16, Revelation 19, and Revelation 20. So the language used to describe all of those wars are incredibly similar. So much so, I believe it points to the fact that they are all describing one war. The second reason why I believe that the millennial reign of Christ is not a literal thousand years is, again, is, is a similarity issue, a language issue. So remember back in chapter 17, we saw this phrase, the beast who was, is not, and is to come. Like, it's really peculiar, even just how it reads, right? Like, man, what does that... It's like, it's not, it sounds like it's not said right. Like, somebody has read something, and like, I think you need to say that again. That's not right. The beast who was, is not, and is to come. And, and so we're talking about the Antichrist. And Antichrist is, oh, get this, Antichrist. Clever, isn't it? So Jesus is described as the one who is, sorry, the one who was, who is, and is to come. Like all the way through the book of Revelation, Jesus is always referred as the one who was, is, and is to come. And so this is the anti-that, was, is not, and is to come. Now, this, this phrase we would see recapitulated, don't you love that word? But stretched out in chapter 20, verses 1 to 3. Here's what I mean. So chapter 20, verses 1 to 3 reads this. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key to the, to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, closed it, and put a seal on it so that he would no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years were completed. After that, he must be released for a short time. So in that, I believe what is stretched out in different language is the beast who was, is not, and is to come. Here's what I mean. So then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He seized the dragon who was, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Bound him would be is not. And he threw him into the abyss, closed it, and put a seal on it so that he is no longer able to deceive the nations until the thousand years is completed. After that, he must be released for a short time, is to come. So I believe you have a recapitulation of that phrase, the beast who was and is not and is to come, stretched out here at the first three verses of chapter 20. As well as that, we have this similarity to, from what I just read, Revelation 20, to Revelation chapter 9 and Revelation chapter 12 in that Satan is not allowed to have full access, and that his time is being cut short. In Revelation 9, it reads this. The fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth, and the key for the shaft to the abyss was given to him. He opened the shaft to the abyss, and smoke came out of the shaft like a smoke, uh, sorry, yeah, like smoke from a great furnace, so that the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke in the shaft. So most people believe, most commentators believe that the star that had fallen from heaven to earth is Satan, and he has been allowed to open the abyss, and then locusts come out of, of the smoke onto the earth, and power was given to them like the power that scorpions have on earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree. But listen, only those, only those, only those people who had been uh, who do not have God's seal on their foreheads. So his power is limited. They were not permitted to kill, but were to torment them for five months, for a limited time. Their torment is like the torment caused by scor scorpion when it stings someone. So as Satan is releasing this, uh, these locusts from the great abyss, he is still leashed and still has 
been confined and does not have full access and his time is being short. He's only allowed to, this is in chapter 9, remember, he's only allowed to um, torment those who do not have God's seal on their foreheads and he's only allowed to do that for five months. So we have limited access, short period of time. In chapter 12, again, a really a recapitulation of what the dragon is allowed to do and for how long he's allowed to do it. So in Revelation chapter 12, verses 9 to 12, it says this. So the great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the one who deceives the whole world. He was thrown to the earth and his angels with him. Then in a loud voice in heaven, then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have now come because the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before God night and day, has been thrown down. And it says, and they conquered him. They conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. So we have a defeated foe, limited access. Therefore rejoice, verse 12 says. Therefore rejoice you heavens and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and sea because the devil has come down to you with great fury because he knows his time is short. So in all three passages, in chapter 9, and in chapter 12, and here in chapter 20, we have a recapitulation emphasizing and showing the similarities that the devil has limited access for a short period of time. The third reason, the third reason that I believe that the thousand-year reign of Christ is not literal on the earth would be a, the chronological factor. So the positions that we were talking about a little bit earlier, particularly the premillennial position, says that this battle in, in chapter 19, verses 17 to 21, happens at the end of the great, the seven-year Great Tribulation. So I tried to kind of give you that visual there. And, and so right before, you know, that big cube of the millennial reign of Christ. So let me just... So... Yes, yeah, so the view is that this epic battle in Revelation 19, again, happens right here, where the beast and the false prophet are defeated. So the position is that the battle in Revelation 19, verse 17 to 21, happens at the end of the seven-year tribulation in which Christ comes and defeats only the beast and the false prophet and then sets up his earthly kingdom and reigns for a thousand years on the earth. So, okay, so that's the theory that this millennial reign is Christ reigning on the earth. During this time, Satan is bound from deceiving the nations, as we read. Right, he's bound for a thousand years, and he was thrown into the abyss, closed it, and put a seal on it so that he could no longer deceive the nations, it says in Revelation chapter 20, meaning that he cannot stop the good news of Jesus Christ from being spread. He cannot stop people from being saved by grace. Then after the thousand years, Satan is released and allowed for a short period of time to wreak havoc on humanity. And then another great battle happens where Satan and death are defeated finally. And then we have this great white throne of judgment that we're going to get to eventually. Uh, that would happen. In order for that to work chronologically, where we've got chapter 19 battle, we have a millennial reign of Christ, and then we have another battle here. If we're to follow that chronologically, we would have to do some really clever hermeneutical gymnastics to make it work. Here's what I mean. In 19 verses 20 to 21, we read this earlier, but let me read it again. The beast was taken prisoner. So this is the, the epic battle at the end of chapter 19. The beast was taken prisoner, and along with it, the false prophet who had performed the signs in its presence. He deceived those who accepted the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image and with its signs. Both of them were thrown alive into the lake of fire uh, that burns with sulfur. Verse 21, the rest were killed with the sword that came from the mouth of the rider on the horse. And all the birds ate their fill of their flesh. I know that's gross. If we are to understand this chronologically, which we've already established rarely happens in the book of Revelation where anything follows any chronological order. Remember that way back in, in week number three, I talked about it's like being at an, uh, an art museum. And you're looking in a room that was called transformation. I think I used that word uh, where Julie and I were at the Albright Knox in Buffalo. And so you've got a picture that describes transformation. Then you look at another one, it's called transformation, but it's completely different. Um, right, so we've got, 
rather, rather than things happening, this happens event, and this happens, and then this happens chronologically, it's more this happens, and then I see a picture of this, and then I see a picture of this. That's more common in Revelation. So if, we're, if this is to be understood chronologically, in that we've got a war, we've got a Satan is bound and not allowed to deceive the nations, Christ reigns for a thousand years, and then we have another war. If those events are to happen chronologically, the hermeneutical gymnastics I'm talking about are, are this. In Revelation 20, Satan is bound and not allowed to deceive the nations. But Revelation 19 tells us there are no nations left. Are you tracking with that? So that's why I wanted to read those two verses in Revelation 20 and 21. So, right? So if Satan's not allowed to deceive the nations, well, who was just involved in the war previous to that if we're looking at this chronologically? Come gather together for the Great Supper so you may eat the flesh of kings. We've got kings in the battle. We have military commanders in the battle. We have the mighty in the battle. We have the flesh of horses in the battle. And then it says this, the flesh of everyone, both free and slave and small and great. And so Jesus comes and he defeats. He, the beast is taken prisoner. I mean, he doesn't even stand a chance. There is no battle. He doesn't even get his sword out in time. And Jesus defeats him. The false prophet is gone. But in verse 21, it says, and the rest were killed. So it would be my understanding that if this was to be seen chronologically, then there would be no nations to deceive, according to Revelation 19, verse 21, and that they've all been, they've all been killed with the sword that came from the mouth of the rider on the horse. That makes sense? So that's why I think the chronological factor plays into this as well. And then finally, the fourth reason why I don't think it's a literal thousand years is because numbers in Revelation are figurative. We talked about this in week three, and that numbers will always represent something else. And that the figurative use of the number 1,000 in the Old Testament found in, in Deuteronomy and Joshua and Job and Psalms and Song of Solomon and Isaiah, um, it's all figurative. And then we have figurative temporal uses in Deuteronomy and Psalms and Ecclesiastes and and uh, where we'd find God's covenant forever or an everlasting covenant. And it's equated with the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. We sing that song on Sunday mornings, right? Like in a thousand generations. Are we talking only about a thousand generations? Or is that more of just figurative? We, when we sing it, we're not saying, look, Lord, just bless the thousand generations. I know we're not, right? That's kind of facetious. And I know you're with me on that. But really, test me on this. Because I can't find any use of 1,000 in Scripture when it refers to a time frame where it's actually talking about a 1,000 years of a time frame. So in all of those, these are all verses that would use a 1,000 years and it would be figurative of something else. How many of you know uh, the very popular verse in Psalm 50, verse 10? No? Oh, that's, wow. Good work. Say that louder. God owns a cattle on a thousand. Does he own cattle on a thousand and one hills? Yes. Maybe. Perhaps. If you said perhaps, I would have asked you to leave. <laughs> no, that, that's right. It's, it's completely figurative, right? He, of course he owns a cattle on a thousand and one hills, not just a thousand hills. And so in light of those examples, the many, many examples, and again, test me on that. If there are any other time frames that are figurative, I know that in, I just read, uh, I'm just catching up on our, our daily reading, the chronological through, you know, like going through the Bible chronologically and reading uh, Numbers 31 and seeing that uh, Moses called for every tribe to give a thousand men to go into battle. And they had 12,000 men going. That was a literal 1,000 men. But when talking about a time frame in Scripture, it's always figurative as far as I can find. So, in light of all of these examples, the millennium should probably be taken figuratively and possibly just a reference to a long period of time. And I believe it is the period that it's describing, again, is a recapitulation of the time between the two advents of Christ. Cross, resurrection, ascension, to when he returns again. Psalm 90 verse 4 is another example. For a thousand years in thy sight are like yesterday when it passes by. Those are the four reasons why I believe the thousand-year reign of Christ is not to be taken literally. 
But those aren't the only verses that mention the thousand years. So let's keep going in verse four to six of chapter 20. That says, then I saw thrones and people seated on them who were given authority to judge. And I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and who had not accepted the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and, all, and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. I don't think I have that on the slide, but well, I can put it back to this one where you can barely read it, uh, about a thousand years. But did you notice, nowhere, and I know this is assumed, but nowhere does it say Christ reigns on earth for a thousand years. Like nowhere in the text does it actually use that terminology. And the reason why I think that's brought in is because of this, this image of those who are resurrected, coming to life, reigning with Christ for a thousand years. And so we're going to try to figure out what makes sense, or sorry, how to make sense of that. Because they use this term, there's this term here called the first resurrection. The first resurrection, this is verse 5. So, he, so John sees thrones, he sees, sees people seated on thrones, and he sees the souls of those who had been beheaded. So those are People of faith, people who are followers of Jesus Christ, and they did not accept the mark, so they were faithful to Jesus until the end, killed because of their faith. And he says he saw them come to life and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Now, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. So there's obviously a difference between those who are following Christ and those who don't when they die. But he says this is the first resurrection. Now, that word resurrection in its best translation, means bodily resurrection. So many, and I'm, I'm kind of giving this to you, many would say this is the hurdle for those who are an amillennialist that believe that, that Christ is reigning now and that, and that the millennial, millennial reign of Christ is happening right now and that we are in it. Is this one verse, or that was one sentence, this is the first resurrection, because that word resurrection uh, is the Greek word anastasis, which means bodily resurrection. And so the dead aren't, like the dead are still dead. Like they're still in their graves, right? So this would be the a challenging and, 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 but I want you to notice that it doesn't just say this is the resurrection. It says this is the first resurrection and first then therefore qualifies the word resurrection making it specific, but which does not negate a bodily resurrection of sorts. Here's what I mean by that. In Deuteronomy 34, verse 5, Moses dies. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the Lord's word. He buried him there in the valley of the land of Moab. So, so Moses dies at the end of Deuteronomy. And he's buried at the end of Deuteronomy. But in Mark chapter 9, it says this, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves to be alone, and he was transfigured in front of them. And his clothes became dazzling, extremely white, as no launderer on earth could ever whiten them. Elijah appeared to them, with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And they were talking. Moses is dead and buried, and yet in Mark 9, he's verbally communicating with Jesus. So this gives us a, a picture, and, and it really helps us understand what's happening in Revelation chapter 20, about those who came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, it's describing and helping us qualify that term, the first resurrection. And it's also kind of cool, isn't it, that we can, we can actually see this. And, and, and Moses, who at the end of Deuteronomy did not get to enter the promised land here in Mark 9, is standing in the promised land. But he's communicating. So he's still, his body is still buried in the ground. But he is in heaven talking with Jesus. 
Now the other part of that is really cool is this should should really this should really give us so much comfort about our brothers and sisters who have passed away. And that I can understand from this, I can understand where my grandparents are. They have, they are, they are described here in Revelation 20. They've come to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years until he returns. Those who are, are followers of Jesus Christ are, this is the first resurrection. This is Paul describing that to, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So I believe that is a way for us to understand what is going on from verse 4 to 6. Now, after all that, you're probably like, I don't even know what's going on. And as I said to Leighton earlier, you'll be kind of gathering your life around you. You're trying to figure out your head's kind of spinning off. So in light of all that, let's sum up everything that we've talked about so far. The thousand years of Christ's millennial reign is referring to all of human history between the two advents of Christ. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, post-resurrection, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. All authority has been given to Jesus on heaven and on earth. And so for me personally, it doesn't really make sense. I guess I get it, but it doesn't really, really make sense to say sometime in the future, Jesus is going to reign for a millennium. Because I, I think he's saying that right here. All authority. There's not another higher you know, role of authority that he's going to have at some point in time in the future. Satan is permitted, allowed, he's on a leash to still exist here on the planet, but he cannot deceive the nations. So this, this, this sense that the, the accusation would be somebody that would be uh, thinking that we're living in the millennial reign of Christ, and you're, is, is that, so you're, Todd, you're saying that Satan is bound right now. We're looking at all the things that are happening in the world, and I would say yes. Yes, he is. But Revelation 20 qualifies what he's bound from doing. He cannot deceive the nations. He cannot deceive the nations. So he can tempt. He can torment. He can persuade. He can affect governments and he can affect false religions. But he cannot deceive the nations. He can try, but he will not succeed. And since deception does not work against those who belong to Jesus, his next option is to annihilate the church, which is leading to this epic battle that I believe Ezekiel 38 and 39 and Revelation 16 and Revelation 19 and Revelation 20 are all talking about the same battle. It's when Satan is fed up because all of his tricks haven't worked. And so he's like, I've had enough. Nothing else has worked. I'm going to take out the church. And he wages war and he gathers those from all over the earth. And I know this sounds really crazy to think that this is coming, but we're just trying to be as biblical as possible. That he, he's going to go and he's going to try to annihilate the church and he will be released for a short time to gather those who are his. So he's going to be, the leash is going to be extended. Never let go, but extended. God is always in control. To gather those who are his, Satan gathering those who are his, to prepare for the final battle against Jesus and his army, which is the battle of Armageddon. And what we just talked about there, verse 4 to 6, those who belong to Jesus and who pass away are raised to life in heaven and reign with Christ. For to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If you have any questions, write them down. We're going to get to a, a time in a bit. But that, that kind of concludes that portion. So if you've got your Bibles open, let's keep going. Revelation chapter 20, I want to read verses 11 to 14. It's interesting that, you know, when we talk about uh, judgment, good, evil, um, we have just this really short passage that's, that's specifically talking about judgment. Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15 says, Then I saw a great white throne and one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence. No place was found for them. I also saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. 
Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works. Sorry, according to their works by what was written in the books. Then the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and then death and Hades gave up the dead and that were in them, and each of was judged according to their works. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. That's, we have this short paragraph, this culmination, this climax of of, you know, the sixth seal opened, seventh seal opened, which really represents the end of all of, of human history and God's judgment coming, and then these, this just, just really quick snippet. But if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 25, it gives us a little bit more. So as you're turning there, just to remind you, like, what we just read is very reflective of chapter 4 and chapter 5 and talking about the one who is seated on the great white throne Earth and heaven fled from his presence. God is the one on the throne. So we see similar language in chapter 4 and chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to verses 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. So this is what we also see as we just read in Revelation 20 verses 11 to 14 is that final judgment on all people. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes, clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then, then he will say to all, also to those who are on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the internal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you didn't take me in. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison and you didn't take care of me. Then they, will, they too will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or without clothes or sick or in prison and not help you? And then he will answer them, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. We have this different picture. Perhaps you could even say a recapitulation of Revelation 20, verse 15, or Revelation 20, verse 15, sorry, Revelation 20, verses 11 to 14 gives a recapitulation of what we just read in Matthew chapter 25. Many similarities, and just so that we're not confused in both passages, just because I was confused, and if I'm confused, then, well, maybe nobody else is confused. It says that they were judged according to their works. But what does that mean about faith? Is this really about what we do? Because Matthew 25 seems to say this sort of the same thing. Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you or thirsty or give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger or take you in, right? It sounds like do this or do that or I did this and I didn't do that. And so it would seem to me that, that verse 37 in chapter 25 is very reflective of Revelation 20 verse 12. But that's not what saves those who are sheep. That's not what saves those who are in the, in the Lamb's book of life as talked about in Revelation 20. I believe it's mentioned in verse 34 of chapter 25 of Matthew when it says, the king will say to those on the right, come, you who are blessed by my father, you who have put your faith in Christ, you who have been saved by grace, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So we have similarities between the two. The judgment that will come at the very end Each one judged according to their works. Their works are a result of their faith. In other words, how do I know if I've got faith in Jesus Christ? By seeing how we live. 
we have this brief description of the judgment, an end times judgment. And then follow with me as we read the new creation in chapter 21. And again, this is one of these passages I, I think that doesn't need much interpretation because I'm not even sure how we would interpret it, but rather just to wonder at our, you know, through our imaginations. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. And then I heard a loud voice from the throne, look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more, because the previous things have passed away. And the one seated on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. He said, write down... Right, because these words are faithful and true. And then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will freely give to the thirsty from the spring of the water of life. The one who conquers will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowards, the faithless, the detestable, the murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that, that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had held the seven bowls, filled with the last seven plagues, came and spoke to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And then he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, arrayed with God's glory. His, her radiance was like a precious jewel, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. The city had a massive high wall with 12 gates. 12 angels were at the gates and the names of the 12 tribes of Israel's sons were inscribed on the gates. And there were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, and three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. The city wall had 12 foundations and 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb were on the foundations. Remember, 12 encompasses the fullness of God's people. The one who spoke with me had a golden measuring rod to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The, the city is laid out like a square, its length and width are the same. He measured the city with a rod at 12,000 stadia. Its length, width, and height are equal. He measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to a human measurement, which the angel used. The building material of its wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold, sorry, pure gold clear as, as glass. The measurements there, they've, they've measured this, and that's a perfect cube. The foundations of the city wall were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first foundation is jasper, the second sapphire, third chalcedony the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth carnelian, I'm butchering these words, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chryso, chrysoprase, chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst, the twelve gates are twelve pearls, each individual gate was made of single pearl, the main, the main street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. This were very reflective of what we would read in Revelation chapter 4 in the throne room of God in majesty and glory. I did not see a temple in it because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it because the glory of God illuminates it and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light. The kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never close by day because it will never be night there. They will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only what is written in the Lamb's book of life. Only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then he showed me the river. This is chapter 22. He showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the city's main street. Right? Try to imagine this as best as we can. The tree of life was on each side of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month. It's very reflective of the Garden of Eden. The leaves of the tree are for healing the nations, and there will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will worship him, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. People will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun 
because the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. We have a breathtaking view of what is to come after the great judgment, after all these things are done away with, and we have a new heaven, new earth, God dwelling with his people. No, I love that there's no sun because Jesus himself is the sun with us at all times. So we have this beautiful ending and description of the new creation and new Jerusalem that is to come. Okay, I want to pause, in, and so if anything that we've talked about either tonight or throughout these, these last six weeks, to seek um, any clarity, if you have any comments or any questions. And then I want to kind of cover four takeaways. We are at 25 after 8, which is a lot later than I thought it would be. But thanks for sticking with me. I appreciate it. Questions, comments, clarity. It just all makes sense. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Yep. So there was a book once written. Um, it's called, uh, oh my goodness, I just lost it. No, oh, never mind. I just lost it. It was just in my head. Um, yeah, I can't remember. Sorry. Uh, yeah, but the, but the sort of that idea of we're going to spend forever in heaven is not a biblical idea looking at Revelation, right? So we've got a, uh, a renovated earth, and that's not a really good word for it, but, but very highly renovated earth. Yeah. Yeah. New heavens, new earth. God dwelling with his people forever and ever. Death is no more. Tears are no more. Like things that we can't even imagine, even in those things, um, will be true. Yeah. Anybody have any any big sorry sorry? Okay. Other than a cube, no, not not that I've been not, not that I learned. Yeah, no. Um, it like in in I think the twelve thousand, the twelve thousand, and the twelve thousand, and the twelve thousand. All the measurements um, are and, and all the the twelve angels at the gates and the twelve tribes of Israel, and then this is the twelve foundations and the twelve apostles and the twelve names. Again, twelve, 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 and actually. 12 is used 12 times. So you have the very fullness of God's people and the fullness of his creation and the fullness of his authority and the fullness of his sovereignty working in this time. Yeah. Any, let me transition this way. Do you have any big takeaways from, from, from anything we've learned in the last six weeks? Tonight? Yep. Invited us to look at a video where there were men who had different perspectives on things mm -hmm. and uh, highly intelligent men. And I really appreciated how they were able to discuss in a loving environment their different perspectives mm -hmm. and remain respected. And that, that would be a dream that I would have of this. That uh, we can agree to disagree, we can yep. remain one body, we love each other. Yep. And uh, that's something that I think. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Ray. I'm going to read one for you. So, uh, somebody that's been watching online has given me permission to read her, her takeaway. She asked me to read it. Uh, so, Gail, Gail Larmond. She said this, I want to share something that is coming more into focus for me while our Revelation study, and that is a better glimpse of the church triumphant. It's easy to spend more time trying to decipher all the fantastic and frightening things and diminish this. Todd, I'm glad that you're emphasizing how much God loves his church, the bride of Christ, 
What will it be like to come and dine at the marriage supper? F.F. Bruce says in Revelation 19.6 that it's the keynote of the whole book that says, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. In the past, when reading Revelation, I have hung on to things like God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes and shall not, and there shall not be, uh, shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, and the leaves of the trees shall be for the healing of the people rather than sorting out the seals and the bowls and the plagues and the beasts. Right now, the end of the story is more in my line of sight when I hope to hear him say, come, let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of, white, of life freely. So that was Gail's takeaway. I appreciate it. That was lovely. All right, let me give you my takeaways. So just hang on. You've got half an hour more of this. I'll try to, it might not even be half an hour. My four takeaways, and there could be a lot more. The first is, is to be careful what you hear. Many times in and throughout, especially at the end of the letters written to the seven churches, the beginning of Revelation in chapters two and three, Jesus wraps up each each, each portion by saying, let anyone who has ears to hear, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. And so I admonish you and exhort you to, to examine and to study and to test everything I have said. I have tried to present this with some absolutes, and a perhaps. And so the study of eschatology is not a divisive issue. That's an absolute. Christ will return. That is an absolute. He will gather to himself in victory all those who put their faith and trust in him. That is an absolute. But on the events that will lead up to that reality, like, you know, the signs of the times, all those come with a perhaps. So I say again, Test everything I've said. I've endeavored to be thoroughly biblical in this lab, and I have kept the whole counsel of Scripture in mind, meaning the whole context of God's story of redemption, Old Testament and New Testament. Since being a pastor here at LifeHouse, a lot of people uh, from our church and from outside of our church have sent me videos especially through COVID, uh, that are end time video, end times videos related. And so I've either read or watched or listened to um, David Jeremiah, Prophecy Today, Prophecy USA, Jonathan Kahn, Jack Hibbs, Amir Safadi. I probably pronounced that wrong, forgive me. Uh, just to name a few. There are a lot of voices out there. There are a lot of voices out there. Let me repeat, there are a lot of voices out there. And so there is caution required. Uh, recently, John MacArthur said something great inter interesting. He said, no generation of people has been exposed to more lies and more liars than this one. The internet has created an explosion of lies that is beyond human comprehension. Now, I wouldn't say that those, those names I mentioned earlier are spreading lies about the end times. And with all sincerity and integrity, I've watched them all. Um, and then I've watched their teaching when it comes to end times, and all of it comes with a perhaps. If I'm, if I'm truly going to say mine theory has a perhaps, then so, do their, so does theirs. And so I don't criticize um, necessarily where they're coming from. But my concern is, my concern is, is the in-betweens. It's the statements that are made that are not to do with the end times, but rather are nuggets of heresy dropped into end times discussion. So be careful what you hear. And I'll give you some examples. David Jeremiah is a guy that I used to listen to all the time, and I think he's still on the radio. Um, he has written 12 books on the end times. 12 books on the end times. Two in particular caught my attention. One called The Great Disappearance, 31 Ways to Be Rapture Ready. 
And then he's written another book called After the Rapture, A Survival Guide to the End Times. It doesn't make sense to me why you'd write both. If I'm rapture ready, if I'm adhering to a premillennialist view and all that, but if I'm rapture ready, I don't need to know how to survive the end times, according to that view. One renders the other not necessary. I'm not saying David Jeremiah is writing books to make money, but writing books on the end times makes money. I would say be wary of, of anyone that, that separates the people of God into ethnic classes, where there are some within the kingdom that are more favored than others. Recently, I, I've heard this quoted a verse from 1 Corinthians 12, sorry, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 32 to 33, that says, Give no offense to Jews or Greeks or the church of God, just as I also try to please everyone and everything, not seeking my own benefit, but the benefit of many, so, they may, so that they may be saved. This verse was used in the context that there are three separate groups of people favored by God. There's the Jewish people, they would be favored first, and then there are the Greeks, and then there's the church. I'm not even sure how that makes sense. But, but this is really poor biblical interpretation to say that that one verse in all of the Bible would say that there are three different classes of people within the kingdom of God. This is an example of a nugget of heresy dropped within end times conversation. And so I'm encouraging you, as I endeavor to do, to be biblical. I mean whole counsel of God, Old Testament and New Testament biblical. So if tonight at some point in time, when we got to Revelation chapter 21 verse 1, I said to you that the, that the first heaven is done away with, as it says in Revelation 21 verse 1, and if I add on top of that, that the reason why the first heaven is done away with is because it's contaminated because of the rebellion of Satan. And that because Satan sinned against God in heaven, heaven is now contaminated, sin is now present in, in, in heaven. That's why it has to be done away with. If I was to say that, you should stop me and question that statement. Now, why? Why would that be a big deal to say something like that? Say that louder. If right now heaven is contaminated by sin, then sin can be in the presence of God. Then the cross of Jesus Christ is not necessary. A tiny nugget of so-called truth tucked in to an end times conversation. So I want to encourage you to be very careful what you hear. The second thing, the second takeaway, is get to know this Jesus. Now, what I'm, what I'm about to say is probably the most controversial and offensive thing you've heard in the last six weeks. Be cautious. <laughs> uh, the movies and shows you watch that are about Jesus. Um, Julie and I, every Easter, um, faithfully would watch The Passion of the Christ. We'd watch it every Good Friday. And then um, I noticed that after a while, whenever I was reading scripture and I was reading in through, you know, John 10 and Jesus saying, I'm the good shepherd, I'd picture Jim Caviezel. <laughs> and I, I think, um, I don't think that's right. I think God's given us um, imaginations and creativity, and we can read these stories and, 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 and use the imaginations and brains God's given us to, 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 to vividly see these. Scripture doesn't leave us guessing. I think we, we, we have what we need in the pages of Scripture. And so as, as much as that applies for, remember, what was that, the, the greatest story ever told? That, that's a movie, right, about the life of Jesus? Um, and, and that's who I, I kind of pops in my head, or Jim Caviezel, or... or or, and this is the offensive part, or The Chosen. Um, I've only seen one episode of The Chosen, and, um, and, and even in the one episode I saw, that there was a whole portion of it that, I, that wasn't in the Bible, and I just thought that was odd. It wasn't necessarily a heresy. It wasn't necessarily a, 
um, a lie or a false truth. It was it was just expositing on on things that that that, that are, aren't written in Scripture, and so and so we can be we can be easily um, drawn to things that give us a better picture than we think we get from Scripture. And so I want to encourage you to to get to know this Jesus that we spent six weeks looking at, and and really predominantly in through the book of Revelation. And what I mean by that is the Jesus of of chapter 1, where John turns because he hears a voice and he sees one like the Son of Man who's dressed in a robe with a golden sash wrapped around his chest and the hair on his head was white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes were like fiery flame and his feet were like fine bronze as it was fired in a furnace and his voice like the sound of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand and a sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth and his face was shining like the sun at full strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he laid his hand on me and he said, don't be afraid. For I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forevermore. I hold the keys to death in Hades. If you have young kids, there's something that Julie and I did. I don't know if Alicia remembers this, but as a devotional, we we sat and we we read this together. And we went sentence by sentence. And I said, write, draw, draw what 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 you can imagine. And it came really, really crazy. You remember that? Uh, it was really weird, but it was really, really cool because we're using the minds that God's given us and our creativity and our imaginations in Scripture to come away with something probably not even remotely close to what John's describing. But still, we're focused on this Jesus, the Jesus of Revelation 19, verse 11 to 16. This says, I saw heaven open and there was a white horse and its rider is called faithful and true and with justice he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a fiery flame, many crowns on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except himself and he wore a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses wearing pure white linen and a sharp sword came from his mouth so that he could strike the nations with it and he would rule them with an iron rod. And he would also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God, the Almighty. And he had a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That takes your breath away, doesn't it? This is the Jesus I want you to get to know. Because then when you, then you, when you read this, and then you go to John 10, and you hear, I am the good shepherd. It's not a, it's not a meek, mild feathered hair, white guy. (laughs) No, it's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who says, I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I laid down my life for the sheep. But I also have sheep that are not from the sheep pen. I must bring them in also. They will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. I love that. I read that line. No one takes it from me. I lay it down on my own through the filter of Revelation 1 and Revelation 19. The power and the sword and the majesty and the glory. No one takes my life from me. Love it. Two more. Okay. God is more sovereign than you think. There are things in life that bring a false sense of security. Kind of like if you trust in a GPS to bring you to a provincial park and you find out staring at cornfields. Because all of other securities will fail. But in Revelation, we see a God that has all things in control. So therefore, we can trust him in all things, right? In Revelation, we are given this cosmic picture. We are given this view from behind the curtain that we we see God has all things in control. And so we can trust him with all things that right now God is currently restraining evil. Imagine if you let go. That currently God is protecting the saints spiritually and physically, or until he calls them home. And we learn in his sovereignty that suffering is real, like I said on Sunday morning. Suffering is real, but glory is coming. Suffering is real, but glory is coming. God is more sovereign than you think. And the last thing, the last takeaway, 
is to get busy. This is going to make sense in a minute. Hang on. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, it says this, Now we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from every brother or sister who is idle, that's lazy, and does not live according to the tradition received from us. For you yourselves know how you should imitate us, as we were not idle among you. We did not eat anyone's food for your charge. Instead, we labored and toiled working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. It is not that we don't have the right to support, but we did make it our, we did, but we did it to make ourselves an example to you so that you would imitate us. In fact, when we were with you, this is what we commanded you. If anyone is, isn't willing to work, you should not eat. For we hear that there are some among you who are idle. They are not busy, but they're busy bodies. Now we, now we command and exhort such people by the Lord Jesus Christ to work quietly and provide for themselves. But as for you, brothers and sisters, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take note of that person and don't associate with him so that he may be ashamed. Yet don't consider him an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Now, what in the world does this have to do with end times? The whole second letter to the Thessalonians is written because they focused on the end times and they believed Christ had already come. They were being deceived and so they were, they were, they were watching YouTube videos and getting sent these little snippets and oh, check out this article. And so they were living in such a way that look, Christ is coming back, I'm not gonna bother working anymore. How they viewed how the end would come determined how they were living their lives. And since they believed either Christ had already come or he was coming right around the corner, well, I'm not working anymore. Eat, drink, and be merry. That's why Paul wrote this. That's why he said to get busy. So the question would be, get busy doing what? What are we to, be get, to get busy doing? Well, Paul tells us. We did read this. I think we read this last week. This is earlier on in chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians. So then, brothers and sisters, here's what you're to do. This is how you're to get busy. Stand firm and hold to the traditions you were taught. In other words, read the word. Whether by what we said or what we wrote. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal encouragement and good hope by grace, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good work and word. In other words, if you just spent six weeks meeting on Wednesday nights into the book of Revelation, learn to live from a place of victory, if you believe what Revelation says. <coughs> Let your hearts be encouraged, strengthened in every good work, and live from a place of victory. In addition, brothers and sisters, pray for us. Pray for us that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored. So pray. Spread the gospel. Tell people about Jesus. Pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people, for not all have faith. I love that Paul mentions prayer here and that we learned in Revelation chapter 8, for example, when it says, when he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb and each one had a harp and golden bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So as the Thessalonians would gather and say, okay, Paul told us to pray for him, let's pray for him. And so they'd gather as a church and then they would pray. And, and we see in the book of Revelation that these bowls of incense are brought before the Lord. And those prayers for Paul are in the throne room of God. The Lord is faithful. So trust him. He will strengthen you and he will guard you from the evil one because he's more sovereign than you think. We have confidence in, the Lord, confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will continue to do what we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to God's love and Christ's endurance. This is Paul's encouragement to a church that was just trying to figure out how the end would come. And it wasn't continue to meet and talk about it. It was... Stand firm. You're going to feel the push of culture. You're going to feel the, the temptation to drift in towards Babylon the Great. 
but stand firm and hold to the traditions you were taught. Read the word, live from a place of victory, pray at all times, and trust because God is faithful. And may he direct your hearts to his love and Christ's endurance. I want to finish our series in just reading the end of Revelation chapter 22. Because it ends, the very last verse is really this really sweet prayer, short and sweet. And so as I read, can we stand for the reading uh, of God's word? Chapter 22, verse 6, as John is still with an angel. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, he sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, and the one who heard and saw these things. When I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had shown them to me. But he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Then he said to me, don't seal up the words of this prophecy of this book because the time is near. Let the righteousness go on. Let the unrighteous go on in unrighteousness. Let the filthy still be filthy. Let the righteous go on in righteousness. And let the holy still be holy. Look, Jesus says, I am coming soon and my reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to attest these things to you for the churches. I am the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. Both the spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life freely. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away the words of this book, of this prophecy, God will take away his share of the tree of life and the holy city, which are written about in this book. He who testifies about these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with everyone. Amen. Thanks so much for being here in this whole journey. And uh, if you have any questions, you want to talk about anything, please let me know. I'd be happy to. It'd be a lot of fun. But, um, but thanks, guys. Love you. Thanks.